we have been offering webinars since 2012 and um, through the Asia eHealth Information Network and we hope to continue innovating on these webinars with the help of the UP Medical Alumni Society and the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. Let's get the elephant out of the room and uh, basically uh, address that objective on evidence and I'd like to refer the participants to the book of Ruth Colvin Clark on evidence-based training methods. Um, if you wish to uh, get more information about uh, evidence-based uh, training methods, this book is a good read for pedagogists who wish to base interventions uh, on sound evidence. Um, Ruth mentions basic methodologies that work and those that do not. And uh, I think that if given a chance, we can set another webinar to deal with the content of this book in more detail. But we won't go uh, any more to the specific evidence of uh, Ruth's book. If you go to PubMed and uh, uh, put the search term webinars bracket TI, which is the specific search for webinar as a term in the title of the journal, you only see 20 results. And apparently um, the research is uh, still very young and the evidence uh, is still organizing around the effectivity of webinars for continuing medical education or even undergraduate medical education. And so I think there's an opportunity for the UP College of Medicine uh, through the UP Med webinars to gather stronger evidence to support the use of innovative technologies such as webinars for continuing medical education. So to uh, meet the objectives of the, this webinar, I divided my presentation into three parts. I'll try to pause uh, briefly between parts to see if there are any questions coming from the audience. You can type your questions on the chat window and uh, Ms. Chavarez will uh, relay that to me during the break between the parts. So part one is the ABCDE of webinars. Part two uh, is about other technologies for continuing medical education. And part three are best practice and lessons learned with technology enhanced uh, CMEs. So the term webinar is actually a blending of web and seminar, web being a synonym for internet, and the Oxford Dictionary defines it as a seminar conducted over the internet. So think of it like a, an alternative to the face-to-face -face seminar that we have in our classrooms where we have a lecturer and a group of students attending. But this time, the lecturer is in one room all by himself, uh, supported by a technical support team, and the Rest of the participants are um, either in the workplace or at home or in their own schools. And there's no physical uh, interaction between the resource person and the uh, participants. So a webinar in this case allows uh, more participants to join over an internet connection and achieve the same objectives, which makes for a stronger opportunity to have your message reach a wider audience. So I divided my talk and used the framework of the ABCDE so it's easier for us to remember. So the first is A or about uh, and advertise. Um, so one of the first things uh, you would want to cover would be the topic, that it should be an interesting topic for your target audience. And for this particular series of webinars, we're addressing the needs of general practitioners. And uh, once you have the topic, you would want to disseminate as widely as possible using social networks and social media to ensure that the target audience is reached and they are informed of the web ahead of time. The next A is assistance. And unbeknownst to uh, most of you, because you're not seeing the organizational uh, arrangements that we have over here, is that um, we do have a lot of people helping out in making this webinar uh, happen. Um, that's very important so that the resource, resource person can focus on the content of the lecture while the assistants uh, help with the promotion of the event 
orienting the speaker if the speaker would require help with installing the necessary software or sometimes address their anxiety because it's a new modality. The assistants prepare the online room and also the physical room for the lecturer. They ensure the smooth flow of the program and mitigate the risks. And uh, the, the, the most disastrous thing that could happen is a disconnection while I'm lecturing. And we don't hope to demonstrate that today, if we're lucky. But if that happens, uh, we have prepared some mitigation techniques. Uh, we have engineers at hand to help us out here. And at this point, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chancellor of IP Manila, Dr. Carmen Cita Padilla, and uh, IMS Director Professor Ariel Betan for allowing us to use their facilities and um, ensure that we have the appropriate bandwidth for our webinar today. So B is for bridge. And this is the technology that connects the resource person to the participants. And right now, we are using the GoToWebinar uh, platform, which I presume you're already successfully uh, used because we are already connected. And the GoToWebinar platform um, has been the platform for the UPMED webinar since last year. And we, we hope to continue using this platform uh, as much as we can. But there are other bridges or webinar platforms that you can use. At the Asia eHealth Information Network, we use WebEx, which is the WHO's platform for webinars. There are other options such as Fuse, Join.me, Video.com, BigBlueButton.org, AnyMeeting.com, and a lot more if you search the internet for webinar platforms. Uh, what, what, what would be important would be the feature set that you're looking for uh, from these uh, webinar platforms. And for our case, um, we wanted a platform that was easy to control, to use, had a re reliable performance, delivered uh, good quality uh, connections, offers error correction, has recording capability, can be accessed through mobile phones, and that, had, that came with a very good price. Uh, I'd like to emphasize on error correction because uh, during webinars, you might have participants from remote areas with very uh, slow internet connections. And the error correction capability of the webinar platform uh, compensates for those slow connections. So in fact, some of you might be connecting in, a, in an island and you might be using a mobile phone with a very slow connection. But the go-to webinar platform will compensate for that. And it will uh, ensure that you're getting my lecture in a smooth uh, flow and, and that you are hearing me clearly and that there are no gaps in the presentation. B and C represent bandwidth and connectivity. And uh, ideally, a resource person should be in an area with reliable internet connection preferably with engineers and technical support staff on standby. Participants may join, of course, from any location at their convenience. It becomes more challenging for the participants, of course, because you have limited options on your internet service provider available in your area and the speeds that they offer you. In any case, we suggest that you choose a good spot where the signal is strong and that there are a few others using that Wi-Fi connection. The content is primarily the responsibility of the speaker, but it would do well if they were advised to keep their slides simple with no or minimal animation or special effects. If at all possible, speakers should avoid embedding videos in their presentations as they may not display correctly in the participants' computers or mobile phones given their limited internet speeds. Video also consumes a larger data plan and that might be a cost for people using mobile phones. And because of this group who are in mobile phones, you may want to use large fonts for your slides because phones have small screens. Delivery again 
is speaker dependent and it can be as simple as asking the lecturer to just deliver the usual straight lecture using his PowerPoint slides. And that's very comforting to many lecturers because um, they're used to giving their lectures with PowerPoints. The challenge mainly for webinars is that you are unable to see your audience and their reaction. And those uh, visual feedback are very helpful in helping the speakers calibrate their delivery. But then again, those are the limitations of the technology and we have to live with that. For some speakers who are also uh, still not uh, well versed with PowerPoint slides, um, there's a possibility to just take a real-time video of them using a whiteboard giving an actual lecture. But then again, that would be at the cost of video, which I had already explained in the previous slide. Lastly, letter E, evaluation and evidence. Um, after this webinar, we will be asking you to fill up an online form. Uh, this is our way of understanding your interests and concerns about the webinar, um, helping us revise the protocol as needed. And one of the challenges that we'd like to address for this year's webinar is to measure if learning had happened. So right after this webinar, there will be a clinicking amongst the organizers, and we would uh, try to find a way to measure uh, pre-test and post-test the, 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 the concepts that were transmitted to the target audience. So in summary, uh, this is a simple A, B, C, D, E of webinars. It's not an exhaustive list, but a simple guide if you want to prepare for your own webinar. And I'd like to pause here uh, the end of part one to see if there are any questions that have been fielded. Cha, do you have any? Okay, since there are no questions, then I will proceed to part two. So if you search uh, the internet with technologies that are used for medical education or continuing medical education, you would get a long list and uh, we really don't have time to go through each one one by one. So what I'm presenting are those that have uh, I have personal uh, experience with. So one of them would be Twitter chats. There's Periscope, live social media broadcasts, massive open online courses, and flipping the classroom. So let's go through them one by one. Those with asterisks, I think, are areas uh, for research. Um, if we start implementing them, I think uh, there's a tremendous opportunity to find out whether they are effective modalities for continuing medical education. So tweet chats. So for those who are on Twitter, um, there is a method where you can use Twitter, not just for broadcasting your your messages, 160 character messages, but also to organize an event of participants and resource persons answering specific topics for that particular session. A uh, very uh, popular local uh, tweet chat is Health XPH, and I'm happy that uh, our reactor is one of the founders of this tweet chat. They do this every 9 p.m. every Saturday. Maybe she can talk about this later on. And this is an interest, interesting modality because it consumes very uh, small bandwidth. You can use it on your cell phone. And the interaction between the participants and the resource persons are very rich. And this is one way of uh, showing that you know even participants can be resource persons themselves, which is the current trend right now in continuing medical education. Sorry about the slate slide. So Periscope.tv is a new modality over mobile phones where you can actually deliver live broadcasts. So we can do live broadcast lectures or even perhaps rounds uh, using Periscope because of the mobility provided by the phones. We can use Periscope.tv to feature one or more people uh, talking as a panel uh, 
with the mobility of a mobile phone. So I think Periscope TV is an area for research. It's good that we have Dr. Iris with us uh, from the Medical Informatics Unit. Uh, once we do some prototyping about Periscope.tv, then perhaps we can introduce this as one modality for our UPMed webinar. Massive open online courses. I don't know if uh, some of you have already enrolled uh, with the MOOCs. They call them MOOCs, M-O-O-C. Uh, these are just specialized websites that offer learning packages to participants anywhere around the world. So all you need is a, a laptop or a mobile phone with an internet connection. And you can take these courses for free. And they are uh, credible institutions like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is using edX.org, Udacity, and Coursera, which is uh, heavily linked with the Stanford University. Um, the courses are free, but if you require a certificate, then they may charge you some fees. But for those who are just there for the learning, there's a tremendous material in these MOOCs or MOOCs. Flipping the classroom is basically uh, defined as a reversal of traditional teaching where students gain first exposure to new material outside of class, usually via reading or lecture videos and then class time is used to do the harder work of assimilating that knowledge through strategies such as problem solving, discussions or debates. And um, flipping the classroom would entail, for example, uh, me recording this and then delivering it uh, to a group later on and then meeting that group after they watch the video questions. That makes for a richer experience and interaction between the resource person and the participants. So it's like reversing. Rather than doing the lecture during class time, you record your lecture, ask the students to watch the video, and then they can come to class and just start asking questions. So that really saves time for the faculty that uh, they don't need to repeat the same lecture all the time and uh, sort of like constrains the students to prepare questions for the session, knowing that that is what is expected of them during class time. So this has worked very well uh, for some faculty members. I think Dr. Iris can also mention something about that later on. And then there are more technologies. Um, apparently, the problem right now is that the new technologies as, uh, are emerging at a pace faster than how the teachers can adopt them. So um, I myself um, is already overwhelmed because uh, the, the technologies are coming out faster than I can learn them. And usually the students are more often well versed than the faculty. And that can be a, a challenge for the faculty members uh, because the students apparently know more about technology now than they do. So it takes uh, some maturity as well for the faculty members to um, learn along with the students and uh, grow with them in the use of the technology. But in any case, uh, whether uh, it's new technology, uh, we should proceed with the same principles, with conscientious exploration guided by basic principles of ethics, transparency, and participatory methods, uh, making sure that we're nurturing our students, that we are listening to their needs, and that we are responsive to uh, what they require in terms of learning. And, and in the end, uh, I challenge ourselves as faculty, as resource persons, to make sure that we gather the right evidence and publish our findings so that we can share it to the other faculty members and create a base of evidence for uh, these things uh, that are emerging technologies. Let me proceed to part three on best practice and lessons learned. And um, for myself, I, I one of the things that came up when my class was preparing for uh, these webinars was about intellectual property. And I divide uh, the discussion in intellectual property into two parts, one from the speaker's perspective and the other from the participant's perspective. So from the speaker's perspective, based on Philippine laws, the content is owned 
by its creator. And that right is inherent upon its creation. So this webinar technically is uh, already copyrighted by me. And uh, because I now placed it online, it is now at risk of copyright infringement, which is a natural uh, fear of many resource persons. So if you are such a resource person and you are worried about the copyright infringement of your material, then you may wish to assert your copyright by submitting an application with the National Library or with the Supreme Court Library. And I placed a link here to help you uh, access that online application system. Uh, the cost is 200 pesos if you are willing to uh, invest on 200 pesos and uh, you would in turn get a copyright certificate for your material. So for the resource person that establishes you as the owner of that material. From the participants perspective, uh, I briefly reviewed the intellectual property code Republic Act 8293, Section 185, and they defined uh, what it means to, 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 uh, to use fairly uh, a non-copyrighted work. So 185.1 states that the fair use of a copyrighted work for criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, scholarship, research, and similar purposes is not an infringement of copyright. So as a matter of fact, even if I copyrighted my material, that allows you, my participants, to use my material fairly, as indicated in this uh, section in the Intellectual Property Code of RA 8293. That is limited by your right to gain economic benefit from the material. So because you were able to get my material freely, then you cannot gain economic uh, uh, benefits from my material. So I think that's the other section that follows this. So I would uh, point you to RA8293 if you wish to learn more about fair use of copyrighted work. Next slide. Another best practice is to maximize social media for disseminating information about the webinar or even using social media at the same time we're having this webinar. So we can use Twitter, Facebook, or good LinkedIn and mailing lists to promote the webinar. But as a matter of fact, I think Dr. Iris is already on Twitter tweeting about this webinar and we can use that platform uh, effectively in reaching out not just for people who have access to go to webinar, but even to people in remote places who might only have access to Twitter. So we should open ourselves to uh, multimodality technologies and not just fix ourselves to a certain platform, but be open to expanding uh, the base of participants uh, regardless of the platform that they're, they're, they're able to join. And I think there's a research question here uh, whether social media can be an effective platform for CME dissemination. Providing post-webinar support, uh, I think, is best practice. So after this webinar, it, it, it does not end. Uh, we should allow participants to continue exploring the topic, provide feedback and suggestions to the resource persons and to the organizers. So you can do that by accessing fb.com slash upmedwebinars. That has been the Facebook page of upmedwebinars. And you can leave comments uh, in, in, in that post where uh, the poster of my lecture is uh, placed. We encourage participants to share their own links and resources. You might know of other technologies that can be effective or useful for CMEs. And I think the the University of the Philippines, Manila, can be um, can monitor uh, this post-webinar support because if there is enough interest on a particular topic, and with the help of other relevant stakeholders such as the professional societies, uh, we can actually nurture these people into a community of practice and further along uh, the uh, the uh, development of that topic. 
um, we will be uploading the recording of this uh, webinar in YouTube and uh, that is also another way for the organizers and the resource persons to monitor the interest for that particular topic by measuring the number of people accessing the recordings. You can uh, look at the number of hits and uh, you can look at the comments. And if there's uh, uh, a lot of people recording, then the organizers might consider offering another webinar on uh, a related topic or an advanced topic. In summary, technology offers numerous opportunities for extending continuing medical education to a wider audience. In our context, we are an archipelago. Uh, we have a lot of uh, health professionals in remote areas who cannot just easily travel to attend seminars. Uh, technologies such as webinars really offer tremendous opportunities for reaching out to them and uh, letting them get updated uh, with new advances uh, in medicine. Technology-enhanced CME, however, can be challenging and a committed team is key to success. This team should be on continuous learning mode in order to improve the webinars and we hope that uh, with the support of my classmates, the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and the UP Medical Alumni Society, that the UP Med webinars could be the premier online CME platform for physicians and allied health professionals in the country. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, and I think we can proceed to our question and answer portion. Let's have one of our panelists give his her reaction. So maybe we introduce Dr. Iris E. Siptan. After graduating from the UP College of Medicine, she had her residency in internal medicine at the University of the Philippines, PGH. She was the chief at the University of the Philippines. She was the chief resident in her final year and finished her fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism again as chief fellow. She then attained her Master of Science in Health Informatics, Medical Informatics track. She is currently a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians, a fellow of the Philippine Society of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, a professor of the UP College of Medicine, and the chief of the UP Medical Informatics. She is the recipient of the first University of the Philippines Gawat Pangulo Award for Innovative Teaching and Learning in 2015, the best blog post of the year for the 2015 Philippine Blogging Awards, People's Choice Awards, Health and Fitness Category, 2015 Philippine Blogging Awards, and Philippine College of Physicians 2014 Presidential Award for Social Media Advocacy. Dr. Iris Isipta. So thank you to Dr. Marcelo for that uh, presentation and I have several uh, things that I would like to share uh, with the attendees. Um, he mentioned that there is lack of visual feedback sometimes when you're doing a webinar such as now when we can't see the audience and uh, we were discussing earlier whether we should actually have a talking head uh, which is like a picture of yourself talking inside the slide. Okay, because that will have more bandwidth, but some people require that because they feel that they are more able to listen when they can see somebody talking to them rather than they can just hear you um, on audio. Um, but I have had uh, my own share of making my own lecture videos and it can be very um, off-putting when you can just see the camera blinking at you and you don't actually see an audience uh, and it's easier to have a lecture when you're having the audience but you know this is what the technology can do um, and you can reach more uh, using this technology. Now thank you for mentioning the Health XPH tweet chat so it actually turned two years old this year um, and it is on every Saturday night at 9 p.m. In fact I will be moderating this Saturday's tweet chat and it will be on telemedicine. So uh, the tweet chat goes on for an hour, so at 9 o'clock we invite people to come on the tweet and they introduce themselves for the first five minutes and then we have a website where we actually post the questions to be discussed during that one hour. So we label them as T1, T2, and T3. So for example, last Saturday our topic was time management. 
So, for example, the first question was, what are the things that healthcare professionals do that um, interfere with their with their work? So, how do they manage their time? And then people will now start answering via tweet. So, this is around 140 characters. Our tweet chat is registered on Simpler, and Simpler has a healthcare hashtag project, which means that it keeps our transcripts. So all the topics we have ever discussed on the Health XPH uh, is in a database that has a transcript. Uh, and we're planning to write that up as well. Now, in relation to continuing medical education, one hashtag that I will recommend is FOMED. That's hashtag F-O-A-M-E-D, which stands for Free Open Access Medical Education. So medical professors all over the world, when they want to share something on Twitter, they hashtag it with FOMED so others can use it. Now, Dr. Marcelo mentioned Periscope. So you need an app, uh, a mobile app, uh, which works on a tablet or on a phone uh, to have Periscope, and it works with Twitter. So if I were to Periscope the session today, uh, it would actually send out a tweet saying that Dr. Iris Isiptan is having a Periscope. Uh, I will have the title of the Periscope, and then people can watch live and then they can start asking questions uh, via the chat, which I can answer while I'm actually uh, having the Periscope. We've experienced already having the Periscope for the Global Forum last August when it was held at the PICC. The Health XPH had its sessions Periscope, and we had friends from Canada and the US who were actually watching our session. So they were, they were able to attend the session virtually via Periscope. Now, for Periscope, the link will be available for viewing for 24 hours only, but you have the option to download the video if you so wish. Now, um, massive open online courses or MOOCs were also mentioned by Dr. Marcelo. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that the University of the Philippines has an official iTunes University account. And in fact, we are asking professors to join us in putting up uh, materials there because that can be a MOOC in itself. Already there are some free lectures offered for free about computer science uh, that you can access uh, if you have an iTunes U account. So even if you do not have a, uh, an Apple device, it is available because you can still download iTunes uh, on, on other platforms. Um, flipped classroom. So I'm very happy that you also mentioned that uh, I came from a flipped classroom uh, before going to this webinar today. Uh, I had a session with learning unit for medical students on gestational diabetes. Um, how I did that, I gave them uh, three lecture videos, which I uploaded on a university virtual learning environment or OVLE, or the learning management system, which they all have access to. Uh, they watched it before coming to my session today. And then today, I gave them a 10-minute individual quiz and then I gave them a 10-minute team quiz so that they can decide what the answers are amongst themselves. Because sometimes I can answer A, but for example, you might think the answer is B, and then we can discuss what the answer should be. And then I spend the last 40 minutes explaining the answers, but I make sure to ask them what the answers are first so that I can gauge which people got it correct and which did not. It is very interesting that you mentioned about going the National Library route to actually um, copyright something. Because for myself, I only use Creative Commons copyright. So Creative Commons copyright, you just put up a seal from the Creative Commons Foundation. And what I use is actually non-commercial, attribution required, and share alike. That's the thing I use. All my slide decks, I actually put them up on slideshare.net, and the license I use is that, just Creative Commons copyright. Now, many people are actually afraid sometimes to share their slide decks because they need to check their images. So please make sure you use copyright-free images. And for myself, I use Pixabay or Flickr, which also has Creative Commons license images. So I think that's it, unless there are other questions. Thank you. Um, we will now have the question and answer portion of our webinars. There are questions uh, fine, and uh, the first question coming from Maria Pamela Chua is that how much did this last webinar cost? 
Okay, so um, the, the the largest cost would be the GoToWebinar platform. If you wish to purchase the full version, that's going to set you back about uh, 30,000 pesos a year. Um, another would be the the time of everyone that they contributed here. Uh, I mean, these are specialist doctors who are helping me out here, so they're missing out on their clinic time. Um, the bandwidth is uh, uh, provided for by the university, so that's very uh, helpful and useful. We need to have very good bandwidth, and we were uh, fortunate to to have the information management service of UP Manila uh, allowing us to use their facility. Uh, this is a very fast bandwidth. It's actually connected to the uh, Asia Pacific Advanced Network. And the reason we opted to do it here is they also have uh, very experienced network engineers who can quickly troubleshoot for us in case we get into problems. So um, this uh, uh, webinar can be cheaper, definitely. Uh, but we uh, had inherited a platform from uh, the previous organizers, Class 1990, and that's why we're using GoToWebinar.com. We have two questions from Dr. Lorraine Feldon. The first one is, aside from UP, which institutions or organizations offer CME webinars with PMA units? Okay, I'm not uh, aware about which organizations also offer this. I, I have this from the PCP. No, so he, we're not aware. Uh, what we do know is that the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine uh, is mandated by, by law to be able to provide these uh, specific courses. So I think that's the benefit of uh, linking up this webinar with the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine of the UP College of Medicine because they are they, they, they have a, a, a law that supports them that this is uh, their mandate and that, that they can offer these types of courses uh, to, to health professionals. The other question by Dr. Feldon is, hi, Dr. Eloy and Dr. Iris. Is webcasting or periscoping a live conference allowed? or ethical, especially for those who require registration fees among participants who attend in person. Uh, I just want to share my experience with the webinar app because I am stationed in Agusan del Sur. We have brownouts lasting 6 to 10 hours every day, and I was worried about my battery getting rain, but fortunately the app doesn't take too much power. So I started with 68%. Uh, at the start of the session, now nearing the end, I still have 58%. Thank you. Well, that's very good feedback. So we want to hear uh, from our participants, especially uh, in situations where you are. So thank you very much for that. Uh, regarding Lorraine's question about the ethics of uh, webinars uh, and, 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 live, and Periscope as a live uh, broadcast system, um, as I said, we, we sh should still be bound by uh, our oath of Hippocrates uh, that we should be ethical in the practice of our profession. Um, we should protect the privacy of our patients. We should make sure that we are not divulging confidential information. Um, in, in, in other cases, uh, there's really value in using technology for advancing the study of medicine. So we have to be uh, both careful and aggressive at the same time trying to push the envelope of innovations, but at the same time making sure that the principles of ethics, privacy, and confidentiality are preserved. So um, basically I will summarize this as don't try this at home. <laughs> so make sure that you are guided by principles. You, are, you have peers uh, helping you out and giving you feedback uh, about how you're doing things. This particular webinar is not really an ethical controversy because we're not talking about specific cases, but uh, when it comes to that point, then I think it's good to have a team thinking through the content of the webinar first before actually letting the slides uh, uh, published in a webinar. That helps in uh, making sure that there's a peer review prior to this sensitive material that you might want to share over a webinar. Iris, you might have your own ideas. 
uh, if you're going to Periscope from a conference, you actually have to ask permission from the conference organizers. Um, most people understand that uh, they have to pay registration if they go on site, but they also appreciate when they find out, for example, that because of the Periscope that we did, other people people from far away were actually able to participate. Um, it also depends on how open-minded, I guess, the organizers are because it will also s serve sort of as an advertisement for the next conference. If they see, for example, that it's a good conference and they were able to view it for free for now, and then they might actually want to come physically for the next conferences and um, uh, join. Um, and for example, we had a social media and healthcare summit where we told everyone, periscope as you like. So because we wanted more people to actually have access to it. So just make sure you have the necessary permissions. Uh, we have another question from Valentina Mugayo. Is there any person who we can directly call for inquiry or on how can we make our own module through webinar? If yes, maybe we know the contact person and number. Thank you. Well, you're lucky because uh, the chief of the medical informatics unit of the UP College of Medicine is here. So, Dr. Iris, how do they contact you? Okay, so I'm actually on Twitter under, at endocrine underscore which, or you can um, email me at isiptan at endocrine-witch.net. Having said that, I am also going to be at the Association of Philippine Medical Colleges Convention, which is ongoing today until Friday, I will have a session on how to conduct computer-based um, teaching uh, for medicine. So that might be something you might want to check out. And if you're not able to come, I will be uploading my slide deck to slideshare.net slash isiptan. So you can also look at the stuff I have there right now. So some of you might be wondering, can you remember all of those links? We'll post them on the fp.com slash webinars, and uh, you can track uh, those new links in that uh, Facebook page. Dr. Failona. We have a question from one of our classmates, uh, Dr. Gigi Peron. What legal remedies are available for copyright infringement of our slides and lectures? Okay, we, we, we don't have an actual case right now, Dr. Gigi. Uh, uh, so I don't have experience about, uh, that's called prosecution actually, when you want to assert uh, your rights on your copyrighted material. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, uh, do we have a lawyer in the class? Not yet. Um, but there are um, instances uh, when if you can show proof that you have the copyright because you have uh, the application, the, the, the approval approved application from the National Library, and, and you can also prove infringement, which is beyond fair use, uh, as defined in the Section 185 of the Intellectual Property Code, then I think you have a case. Um, but usually these things are better settled uh, uh, amicably, if, as, if at possible. And the most common reason really for contention is that they sold your material. when. Uh, fair use actually states that they can only uh, use your materials for their own lectures or for um, uh, sharing with others uh, your own content and making sure that you're properly attributed. Uh, when they start selling your materials, I think you have uh, good grounds for uh, asking for uh, retribution for that. Another question from uh, Maria Lea Pascual. What is your recommended number of participants for every webinar? Oh, okay, so that's where it differs between a face-to-face -face seminar and a webinar. So in a face-to-face -face seminar, uh, you only have limited seats, so you don't want people uh, standing room only. Of course, you want to have a lot of people, but then the, they, will, they will be uh, uncomfortable in a webinar, you want to max out the number of seats that you've already paid for. So if you're already paying for a go-to webinar room for 100 seats, then you might want to have as many people logging in. Now, another innovation that's possible is that in one connection, uh, in a remote place, they can have another group of people all together in one room um, sharing that single connection. And that has been done effectively uh, by 1990 last year as well. And that's also possible with the UP Med webinars for this year. 
uh, by uh, organizing a group of doctors or health professionals, for, for example, in Tagayante de Oro, they can share one go to webinar account and uh, we would be able to deliver the same content uh, with the same quality to more people. And that would also allow the doctors to have networking amongst themselves, perhaps over lunch or dinner, which can really help uh, uh, nurture the topic uh, further on, even if the resource person is already offline. Sure. Um, for the Philippine Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism, we have our inter-hospital grand rounds, which is held um, quarterly here in Manila. But now we already have a training program in Cebu. So usually when we now have our inter-hospital grand rounds, they're online. And we are online so that they can see us. They're gathered in one hospital, in Shongwa Hospital, watching the inter-hospital grand rounds here in Manila. And they can also ask questions. Now some of our consultants are unable to come to the venue in Manila because of traffic. But now they can also view view and participate from their own clinics uh, using a, a webinar type of a setup. Uh, last time we also use uh, GoToWebinar, yes. Thank you. Uh, there's a similar question for, for that particular topic from Angelica Moreros. How many modules per year can the 30,000 per month accommodate? Oh, ah, okay, so the, the 30,000 is essentially a subscription to go to webinar, and you can use the room uh, one session at a time, 24 hours, seven days a week. So it's basically uh, up to you to maximize your account. If you already paid for an annual subscription, then you know after we end at 1 p.m., then you can have another webinar between 1 to 2, another webinar 2 to 3, and um, that's the... You know, that's the value that you get. Uh, so if you start counting the opportunities for offering one-hour webinars, it comes to really very cheap uh, cost per hour to use the webinar platform. So uh, I, I would go for uh, annual subscriptions uh, with uh, maximizing the, the, uh, the platform by offering as many material as you, uh, material as you can. Um, question for Dr. Iris from Maria Pamela Chuba, can you identify again where you get images that are safe to use? So as I mentioned, it's Pixabay, pixabay.com, and also P-I-X-A-B-A-Y, Pixabay. Uh, there's also freeimages.com. Uh, they have rules about attribution, but uh, as long as you follow the rules for attribution, you're safe. Um, then you can also go to Flickr, uh, and when you do a search on Flickr, there's an option to to say, I only want images that are licensed under Creative Commons copyright. And then if the Creative Commons copyright is just share a like and attribution required. So I just put a small note uh, beside the image that says uh, image by Dr. Marcelo and then the link on Flickr so that if others wanted to use the same, um, they could do it. Um, please be aware that the people who post the photos, they're actually very happy to see uh, if you use their photos. And I even have had several emails where I got um, feedback from the photographer saying, thank you for using my photo in a medical lecture. It has never been done before. So he was actually very grateful for that. Thank you. We have a question from one of our webinar organizers all the way from Davao. Uh, from Bitbit Serrano, what about Google Hangout? Uh, what is the limitation of the new Google Hangout for use in webinars? Um, we try to, um, in a separate, uh, in a different group, we tried Google Hangout, and um, I was not really satisfied with the performance of the system. Uh, it might have been a you know, local specific problem at that point. Um, it boils down to reliability of the service uh, that we've been very successful in obtaining from GoToWebinar and also WebEx.com from the Asia eHealth Information Network. And uh, essentially also a, a, a way for you to um, email somebody uh, from GoToWebinar or WebEx.com and ask them for support uh, when you have such platforms uh, in this case. Um, when Google Hangout hangs, you don't know who to call. So essentially, I think that's the the, the crucial. If the platform is working, then everything is okay. But when the platform is not working, then you need to get recourse 
to somebody who can fix it. And that's basically a get when you pay for a webinar platform. I think we're on our last question. Question from Eileen Dualan: Does the number of participants affect the download speed in webinars? The answer, uh, short answer is no. Um, basically, uh, the, the webinar platforms, the popular ones, are cloud-based, meaning that as the, the more participants join, the webinar platform is elastic. It expands its resources to deliver the goods to as many participants so and that's why we like these platforms is because they have this uh, automatic algorithm that allocates as many resources to participants when you start getting you know very popular and you have a lot of people logging into your webinar you don't have to worry about uh, 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 buying more servers or buying more internet connectivity or, or, or faster speeds these webinar platforms will adjust automatically according to demand and um, so there's no limit the only limit is the number of seats that your subscription allows you to use but otherwise uh, each participant should have an even experience because uh, the platforms can adjust whether you use, you're using a mobile phone on a slow internet connection or a laptop with a fiber or a fiber uh, connection at home uh, the experience will be as consistent as possible thank you Eileen with that, um, thank you for that engaging discussion, Dr. Uh, Alvin Marcello and Dr. Iris Isiptan. So as a summary, we learned uh, from the lecture and the discussion that uh, they, they have shared the co cost-effective and state-of-the-art technology to enhance medical ed education. They have enumerated the key steps, the ABCDEs of medical education, for the successful adoption to enhance uh, that the adoption of technology in medical education. We have seen the references that we can use on evidence-based research on the use of technology for medical education, as well as the risks that accompany the adoption of the technology. We have learned things about uh, intellectual property rights and getting copyrights for our lectures, how to maximize social media, as well as giving post-webinar support whenever you conduct uh, such an activity. So, with that, after the session, an email containing a survey link will be sent to you. And after answering the survey, your certificates will be sent to you. Please answer the survey so we can assess our webinar and address more of your preferences and give you materials from this session. Thanks for joining, joining us and hope to see you again in our next webinar entitled Management of Sore Throat with the speaker, Dr. Teresa Cruz, on February 24, from 12 noon to 1 p.m. Manila time. Please invite your colleagues to join this continuing monthly CME webinar series. All webinar schedules and resources will be posted at the www.upm.edu.ph slash up slash medwebinars. So in behalf of the UPCM Class 1991 and the UP Medical Alumni Society, we also thank our collaborator units, the UP Manila Information Management Service, the National Telehealth Center, the UP College of Medicine Postgraduate Institute of Medicine and Medical Informatics Unit, DOA, and Ms. Charisse Orhalo, our host. This is Dr. Maki Failona together with Dr. Alvin Marcelo and Dr. Iris Isiptan and the UP Med webinar team closing this session. We hope you have learned a lot from today's webinar. Join us again on February 24 and have a great weekend ahead.